Picosan is an Algonquin Indian term meaning swamp on a hill, and it's a very good descriptor for what we have out here. Even though this land looks very, very flat, there are slight differences in elevation as you go across the landscape. Where those elevational changes occur, why they occur is from the development of the peat soils. Peat is a high organic content soil. It develops uh, when uh, the area is underwater or in, in a wet state. Uh, the leaves and, and dead material from the plants fall and uh, in that anaerobic condition under the water, it builds up over time and creates a dome so that uh, the Indians had it right when they said swamp on a hill, you've got this high organic content soil that acts like a sponge and as the rain falls on it, the sponge holds it and releases it very, very slowly across, uh, across the landscape. What's happened though over time is that people have come in and in order to use the land for farming or for pasture or other purposes, uh, they've ditched and drained the land and so the sponge no longer holds the water because there's a hole cut through it and it's like a, it's like a bathtub drain. You just you pull the plug and it just drains everything off. This dries the soil out artificially uh, and makes it more susceptible to fire uh, and it, and it uh, alters the, uh, the conditions that we have out there. Bacosan Lakes was established uh, to maintain and enhance this unique wetland type that we call Pocosin. And one of the critical components of that habitat type is the hydrology of the area. And that's why we're trying to restore that hydrology to get that water back on the landscape and maintain that bog. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages three national wildlife refuges in the Albemarle Pamlico region. Um, these refuges primarily are based, uh, have a peat wetland base to them. So these peatlands provide a variety of habitat to them. In total, across the three refuges in the Albemarle region, there's about 300,000 acres of drained or degraded forest-based peat wetlands or pocosins that are in need of restoration. And this presents one of the greatest restoration opportunities for peat-based wetlands in the, in the U.S. And in fact, the acreage in need of restoration here is comparable to some of the largest peat wetland restorations internationally. The Nature Conservancy has uh, been active in the Albemarle Sound ecosystem for 40 years. We started here at the Dismal Swamp uh, to, uh, to establish the, the refuge here through a donation to the Conservancy. We then transferred the property to uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service. And, and what we're doing here at the Dismal Swamp and also Alligator River and Pocosin Lakes is really what we call continuity of purpose. Uh, we started out uh, doing land protection work with the service. Uh, we still are doing land protection work, but now we're doing a lot more ecological management, working with the, with the refuges to restore the hydrology of these peatlands. And uh, this is just a, a great example of a, of a partnership between a, uh, one of the most uh, influential uh, federal landowners, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and a, and a, and a national, international uh, uh, conservation organization, the Nature Conservancy to accomplish ecosystem restoration at scale and, and really to be effective uh, to increase the resiliency of these peatlands of fire, we need to be implementing water management at the scale of tens of thousands, really hundreds of thousands of acres. And so the Nature Conservancy is, uh, is stepping up and helping the service uh, find new sources of funding, uh, building a broader pool of stakeholders uh, to secure the, the resources needed to, to deliver uh, restoration at, at a really large scale. So here we are at Great Dismal Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. We're sitting roughly uh, at the North Carolina Virginia line looking at um, the burn scar from the 2011 Lateral West fire. What you're seeing here is the impacts from a deep burning peat fire. Five to six feet of peat was lost. Um, it changes the habitat types and for us, for our management of this area, you know, we're not sure what's going to return. It'll return probably in some scrub brush, but the mature forest and our Atlantic White Cedar restoration project that was occurring in this area um, has now been wiped out. This area is likely not suitable for, for cedar uh, any longer, which historically was a pure cedar stand. By, by restoring the hydrology in the swamp, what we hope to do is reduce the impacts of these fires. The, uh, you know, the ditch network at Dismal Swamp is quite extensive. We've got about over 150 miles 
of ditches. Uh, the first ditch was put in in the late 1700s by a company founded by George Washington. And it really takes time to um, offset the impacts of those ditches. This, this forest system has been drained to uh, one extent or the other for over 200 years. The efforts to control water have really only gotten underway in the last 20 or 30 years in, in an extensive way. This is one of our key water control structures. It provides uh, water control on Cora Peak Ditch going uh, back several miles to the west. And uh, to the east of us, we have no water control. Uh, the water here drains into the Dismal Swamp Canal. Making good progress, there's sections of the refuge where we've really been able to re-wet the peat, uh, resaturate the soils out here, but there's still many areas that we don't have any water control. Since the refuge was established, we've seen some pretty uh, dramatic impacts to shorelines and habitats in this, in this area here. The shoreline is about 200 yards further west than it was uh, back in the 1970s. And in this area we're standing in, the tree line extended several hundred yards downstream from where we are. A complicating factor when salt water and peat soils interact is that the salt breaks down the peat soils at a much more rapid rate, which affects the plant community that uh, is growing on the peat soil. Right now we're standing in what I call a frontline community, which is the communities that are next to the sound and most susceptible to impacts from saltwater intrusion. If we can slow down and manage the saltwater intrusion into these frontline communities, then we're also protecting our peat-based communities further inland, uh, or the interior communities that, that develop on the, the deep organic soils we have over there. Well, Pocosins are important to the Division of Parks and Recreation in North Carolina because it's our mission to protect representative habitats throughout the state. And we have on Dismal, Dismal Swamp State Park and Pettigrew State Park, we have examples of Pocosin vegetation. And uh, frankly, the hydrology has been messed up on these places and we need to fix it. And so um, I've been, uh, we've been studying uh, from people who've been doing this on National Wildlife Refuges and professors at Duke and other places um, in order to try to learn how to go about this. You know, one of the primary reasons that we want to maintain and enhance this Pocosin habitat is for the associated wildlife species that you find here. And there's a lot of them. This is a large contiguous block of forested wetland habitat. There's a lot of neotropical migrants that are associated with this type of habitat. One of our signature species is, is the black bear. Um, we actually have one of the densest populations of black bears reported anywhere in the scientific literature in this habitat. We're standing on the shores of the Albemarle Sound and healthy Pocosin wetlands help water quality in the sound by acting as a sponge so when they're intact they're able to absorb pollutants from the air and they're also able to um, maintain a healthy wetland ecosystem but in their drained state they actually deliver um, runoff from the wetland into the sound carrying with it um, pollutants that are associated with the soil and that have been building up in soils over time. So there will be enhanced delivery of carbon and nitrogen and mercury to the sound water. So one of the important benefits of fixing this habitat is to prevent pollution from reaching the waters of the sound. So one of the, one of the important reasons that we're trying to fix these waters is there are, or these wetlands is that there are downstream spawning areas and anadromous fish habitats that will benefit from all of our work in the Pocosins. As I said, one third of the carbon in the world is stored in peatlands from Russia, Alaska, Canada, or Indonesia, and right here in North Carolina we have vast quantities. There's, uh, as I mentioned, 300 and 350 metric tons of, of carbon stored here. It's over the last 4,500 years. It builds up very slowly, only one or two millimeters a year but uh, that storage, because it decomposes so slowly, over time it basically builds up and creates this vast carbon sink. And that sink is something that's very important for the global climate problem we have. Uh, what we'd like to do is maintain that, not have it burn up in a fire, and we'd also like to increase the rate of storage, which is something we're working on. So I'm standing out here on um, some Pocosin peatland, and uh, as you can see, uh, it's very rich soil. It's full of organic carbon uh, that's built up over thousands of years. And so it's especially important from a climate change perspective that we keep this carbon locked away in these soils. Carbon markets are an innovative uh, mechanism to help 
provide incentives to people to help restore and conserve these lands and keep this carbon locked away and not emitted into the atmosphere. So ultimately the goal of these restoration efforts is to restore healthy Pocosin wetlands. These Pocosin wetlands support a variety of, of unique ecological communities, uh, notably the Atlantic white cedar habitat on these refuges. That's a globally threatened species. We also hope to see healthy pine canebrake communities return and pompine Pocosins.